Okay, Councilwoman, uh, Chair Barron, sorry. Uh, you're ready to begin. Okay, start again? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. My gavel. Good morning, and thank you for joining the Committee on Higher Education for our first virtual oversight hearing of 2021 on housing insecurity among students at the City University of New York. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee and a proud CUNY alum. Before getting into the topic at hand, I want to mention that following the committee's last hearing where we solicited testimony about the National Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education's accreditation withdrawal of Lehman College's nursing family, uh, family nurse practitioner, master of science degree, the school's request to extend the program's accreditation was granted. Without the extension, more than 200 masters of science nurse practitioner students registered nurses who have already risked their lives working tirelessly during the first wave and subsequently provided over 500 hours of additional patient care during their clinical rotations would not have been able to sit for their certification exam. It is my belief that this extension, which is critical for the health and safety of our city as the COVID-19 infection rate once again continues to rise, would not have come about without those same MS family nurse practitioner students speaking up about the issue and advocating for themselves via the media, petitions, and at our hearings. We as a city owe a debt of gratitude to these essential workers, and I am proud of what they have accomplished. Now on to today's topic. Housing insecurity is an umbrella term that includes a broad set of housing challenges people may experience from affordability, safety, and quality to its ultimate expression, homelessness. Even prior to the pandemic, housing insecurity among CUNY students was a known problem. A 2018 uh, hashtag real college survey assessing basic need security among nearly 22,000 undergraduate students at 19 community campuses found that a staggering 55% of respondents experienced housing insecurity and 49% experienced hunger in the previous year. Across schools, rates of housing insecurity range from about 44 to 74%. And while 11% of respondents self-identified as homeless, 14% of respondents identified living conditions that indicate homelessness. Across schools, rates of student homelessness range from approximately eight to 20%, with most in the 13 to 18% range. Unsurprisingly, the survey also exposed demographic disparities. Compared to students identifying as male or female, transgender and gender non-conforming, and or non-binary non students reported experiencing higher rates of housing insecurity and homelessness. 34% of transgender students approximately double the rate of students identifying as male or female. And 27% of gender non-conforming and or non-binary students reported experiencing homelessness in the past year. Compared to students identifying as heterosexual or straight, queer and questioning students reported experiencing higher rates of housing insecurity and homelessness. Bisexual students reported the highest rate of homelessness at 21%, while lesbian, gay, and questioning students reported a rate of 19%, whereas heterosexual or straight students reported a rate of 13%. Significant racial and ethnic disparities were also reported. Students who identified as black, indigenous, and people of color generally reported higher rates of housing insecurity and homelessness compared to their peers who identified as Asian, white, or Caucasian. African-American or black students 
and American Indian or Alaska Native students reported the highest rates of housing insecurity with 64% and 62% respectively. 22% of American Indian or Alaska Native students and 17% of African American or Black students responded that they experienced homelessness in the past year compared to a low of 13% among other Asian or Asian American and Hispanic or Latinx students. White or Caucasian students reported 14% homelessness. Additionally, while Hispanic or Latin students reported the lowest rate of homelessness at 13%, they also reported one of the highest rates of housing instability at 59%. Testimony from the committee's June 10th, 2020 hearing on the impact of COVID-19 on CUNY revealed intersectional issues related to food, housing, and financial insecurity among students. Students testified about losing jobs and housing. Some moved into shelters or crowded living conditions while struggling to keep up with their coursework. Other students testified about having to take, uh, take on child or elder care responsibilities. And many testified about having gone hungry at some point during their time at CUNY. Most students testified that they were worried about a tuition hike at the university. While the pandemic turned away, turned many of our lives upside down, it also laid bare the racial inequities that have always existed in the city. Though New York was identified as a coronavirus epicenter during the first wave, neighborhoods with majority Black and Latino New Yorkers, as well as low-income residents, suffered the highest rates. It has devastated my own Brooklyn district, which included the zip code with the highest mortality rate in the city. As the city has also suffered record homelessness and job loss as a result of the pandemic, we need to understand what is going on with housing insecure CUNY students in particular and how the city can better serve them as they work towards earning a degree and making a better life for themselves and their families. We need to take action and institute long-term programming to, in to serve the most valuable New Yorkers. At today's hearing, I'm interested in learning about the full impact of COVID-19 pandemic on housing insecure students. This includes understanding the current number of housing insecure CUNY students and how this status impacts or has impacted their enrollment and academic standing. I'm also interested in gaining a better understanding of the support services offered by the university and on each campus. In addition, the hearing will explore how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted these resources and what the university is doing to help students address these challenges. Before I conclude my opening statement, I want to acknowledge that tomorrow is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Dr. King, our country's highly prominent civil rights leader and a Nobel Peace Prize winner laureate advanced civil rights through nonviolence and civil disobedience. Among his many accomplishments, he participated in and led marches for black people's right to vote, desegregation and labor rights. He led the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott, uh, helped organize some of the nonviolent 1963 protests in Birmingham, Alabama, and helped to organize the 1963 March on Washington, where he delivered his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Dr. King was assassinated in a time of the false sense of white supremacy. And last week, more than a half century later, white, those who hold to that false notion rioted in the Capitol building and demonstrated a culmination of years of a uh, pseudo-fascist regime here in the United States. As we celebrate Dr. King's legacy and observe Martin Luther King Jr. Day next Monday, we cannot forget 
that our country was built on the backs of enslaved people. Systemic racism is a reality in our country and it, it, and it is indeed a part of the reason why BIPIC, BIPOC stu, CUNY students suffer the highest rate of housing insecurity. And every day we must work towards eradicating that evil. And in preparing for this hearing, I would like to thank my chief of staff, Joy Simmons, M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation and CUNY liaison, Chloe Rivera, the committee analyst, policy, senior policy analyst, Michelle Peregrine, the committee's financial analyst, and Frank Perez, the committee's community, community engagement representative. And I would like to acknowledge that we've been joined by my colleagues, Alan Maisel, who is a member of the committee, and uh, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who is a member of the committee as well. As other members join, I will acknowledge them. Now I will turn it over to Senior Policy Analyst Chloe Rivera, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call the first panel. Thank you, Chair Barron. My name is Chloe Rivera. <laughs> and I am the Senior Policy Analyst of the Committee on Higher Education at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you're unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the City University of New York, followed by council member questions, then public testimony. In order of speaking, we have Denise Maybank, the Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management at CUNY, and Sunday F. Coward, the University Dean for Special Programs at CUNY. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Vice Chancellor Maybank? I do. Thank you. Dean Coward? I do. Thank you. I will now call on Vice Chancellor Maybank. Thank you. Good morning and happy new year to each of you. Chairperson Barron and members of the Committee on Higher Education, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony before you on the critical issue of support for City University of New York students experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness. My name is Denise Maybank and I am honored to serve as the interim vice chancellor for student affairs and enrollment management for the City University of New York. I had the privilege of coming before you during the first few days of my tenure regarding mental health and related services and now return to address an equally important area of concern in the lives of CUNY students. I am accompanied today by Sunday Coward, who serves as the University Dean of Special Programs. She will offer insights associated with services that have been provided through our programs formally arranged, organized under the single stop umbrella and now being expanded to the other colleges throughout the system. I will also depend on her for responses to questions regarding services rendered prior to my joining the university some 70 days ago. As the largest urban university in the nation, the City University of New York is described as a transformative engine of social mobility that is critical, that, that is a critical component of the lifeblood of New York City. An integral part of the university's mission is the provision of services necessary to support the accomplishment of the academic goals of each student. 
During my first few weeks in this position, I embarked on discussion with the senior student affairs officers regarding the place in which we need to be to respond to the critical beyond the classroom needs of our students, not only because of the impact of the pandemic, but also because our students deserve optimal circumstances in which to attain their goals and we are best positioned to support them in having that experience. I am and we are committed to our students not merely surviving, but to their thriving through the CUNY experience. You heard uh, Chairperson Barron talk about the City University of New York hashtag real college survey data that survey was conducted in 2018, in the 2018 academic year by the Hope Center at Temple University with funding from the Jewish Foundation for Education of Women and support from CUNY's Office of Institutional Research and Assessment to assess the rates and experiences of food insecurity, housing instability, and homelessness among CUNY students. The results of this survey informed us that of the 22,000 students responding, 55% reported experiencing housing instability and 14% reported being homeless. Among those of us who work closely with students, this reality is certainly evident among so many of our students who come to CUNY against the odds in the interest of improving circumstances and life. Rates of housing insecurity and homelessness were found to be higher among community college students than among those attending senior colleges. These rates were also found to be greatest among African-American or Black students. Since 2007, CUNY has benefited from the work of Dr. Nick Frudenberg and the Healthy CUNY Initiative. This past fall, a guide to surviving and thriving at CUNY was issued to offer students access to resources and information to assist them in addressing academic, health, economic, and social challenges compounded by the pandemic. Based on the data presented in the guide, issues associated with housing instability are identified by CUNY students among the reasons for their decreased ability to do their schoolwork, specifically, 27% of the approximately 2,000 students responding to the survey reported experiencing changes in living arrangements, and 8% indicated feeling unsafe at home as distractors from their academics. From the information provided in the guide, I quote, in the spring 2020 survey on the effects of COVID-19 on CUNY students, about 50% of students reported that they have some worries about losing current housing due to coronavirus. Additionally, 54% of students who had to withdraw from classes last semester said it was because they need to focus on basic needs like housing and food. CUNY provides housing and housing related services through student affairs offices on the campuses and coordinated under the University Associate Director of Student and Residence Life in the central office. CUNY has campus sponsored residence halls associated with eight of the campuses, Baruch College, City College, College of Staten Island, Hunter College, the Graduate Center, John Jay College, Lehman College, and Queens College. Although the residential facilities may differ in design and management, each has staff affiliated with the campus to support student residents through programming, advising, and to respond to student needs. Information regarding off-campus housing options, resources and referrals, is available centrally and through the websites of each of the campuses. This information includes housing locators and guides, tenant rights information, and community resources. In 2016, CUNY entered into partnership with the Administration of Children's Services to provide housing at its residence halls for students through the Fostering College Success Initiative, FCSI also known as the dorm project. FCSI is a college residential support program for youth in care attending CUNY. 
Students in the program receive year-round housing and financial support to cover the cost of CUNY attendance after the application of financial aid awards. Wraparound services and support, including tutoring, coaching, career support, are provided through a subcontract ACS has with New York Foundling. In addition to providing housing, CUNY residents, hall staff, coordinate with New York Foundling staff to provide supportive, a supportive environment for FCSI students. Staff at the CUNY Central Office provide student enrollment and academic data to ACS. Since the inception of the program, 297 fostering college success initiative students have been housed at the residence halls affiliated with City College, College of Staten Island, John Jay College, and Queens College, and more recently, Hunter College. As we grappled with the realities of COVID-19 that beset us in March, residence halls across CUNY closed to plan for the anticipated, for their anticipated use as housing for COVID-19 patients. With the need to de-densify our residence hall population, the summit at Queens College served as a consolidation residence hall for students without other housing options. A total of 2,279 residents evacuated the nine locations across CUNY, leaving 136 residents remaining within their respective halls. 90 students relocated to the summit apartments at Queens College, joining its 120 remaining students. Students at the summit were provided three meals a day, seven days a week on site. Students received hot meal options as well as a snack. Extra security guards were hired to handle lockouts, package distribution and minor tasks throughout the days and nights. Summit staff continued to run the daily office operations so that student ex the student experience would not have any interruptions. Maintenance staff also reported to work daily to keep the building sanitized and safe for the students. Additional student staff were hired to work as members of the evening and weekend sanitation team to ensure the building was being sanitized every three hours from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week, including holidays. Equipped with the PPE necessary to keep them safe, we empowered CUNY students to help other CUNY students while earning additional income during a period of great economic distress. There were 117 students in the dorm project as of March 2020, 40 of whom were relocated or remained at the summit. The remainder of students were relocated to community placements determined by ACS as residence halls reopened in the fall of 2020 in dialogue with ACS, CUNY identified additional space to accommodate students in the FCSI program who wished to return to a residence hall living arrangement. Currently a total of 110 beds are reserved for FCSI students at two locations, the Summit at Queens College with 52 beds and the Hunter College 79th Street Apartments with 58 beds. Although the residence halls did not collect or keep information about where the students went after they evacuated, the general consensus is that most students returned home or went to stay with relatives. In many instances, students remained in contact with staff in the halls and continued to be supported through emergency grants and food pantry services. What we are doing to move forward has to do with our senior student affairs officers of the 25 colleges. We discuss the need to step into this space, making certain we have a coordinated way of addressing the needs of our students and ensuring that all students know where to go when they need assistance to stay on course. Although we no longer contract with Single Stop USA for services, the full complement of associated services continues to be provided at the community colleges and John Jay College. This model is being extended to other colleges in the system to provide continuity of services for students across the system. As students transfer among Q 
CUNY colleges. They should not lose the time identifying resources necessary to assure safety and success. More information regarding these coordinated services will be provided by my colleagues. Partnership with agencies, organizations, and entities providing the services that support and sustain our students and their families allow us to focus on our expertise, our expertise in student success and wellness while assuring that students' needs are holistically met. As an example, we are invigorating the relationship and connection with our partners from the Legal Aid Society of New York. Students stand in need of legal advice regarding unfair and illegal practices by landlords as they seek to navigate challenging economic circumstances that may place them at risk of housing insecurity. With extension of the eviction moratorium, protecting tenants from eviction and new, from eviction and from, and new evictions fi being filed until May, 2021, we seek to keep our students fully apprised of the rules of engagement, informed of their rights and responsibilities and able to respond with appropriate representation when necessary. Our legal aid society partners across the city make this possible. We are exploring ways to track and maintain contact with students we determine to be homeless. At the campus level, staff may become aware of the housing need of a student and may be able to provide a short-term solution through a grant or referral. However, we want to support our students through longer term, more sustainable solutions to address housing instability and homelessness. Identifying the economic and social service resources beyond the university in each borough becomes a mandate for student affairs. Building a network of providers able to support CUNY students in the areas of their greatest vulnerabilities is an extension of our role in transforming lives. We are also in early discussion with one community-based organization about a pilot program to provide housing with wraparound services for a cohort of homeless students. Our plan over the course of the next year is to seed and develop the CUNY Students Thriving Think Tank. This initiative will bring together the researchers who examine the issues that impede the success of college age and college student populations, along with the practitioners who serve students across the CUNY campuses. For data-informed, solution-focused research and response development. This will be a shared space for developing shared understanding and for creating innovative responses to the needs of urban student populations, undergraduate, graduate, and professional. Issues to be addressed include the impact of racial and social injustice, mental health concerns, food insecurity, and of course, housing instability and homelessness. In creating a scholar practitioner experience, we seek to move research to prompt action. As CUNY Students Thriving Think Tank develops, we look forward to sharing the direction and outcomes with you. Thank you, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee for your interest in and attention to this most pressing issue. I trust we are, we are providing information responsive to your inquiry and useful in your deliberations and support. We stand committed to assuring CUNY is a place for th our, of thriving for our students while they are enrolled and beyond. Following testimony by my colleague, Sunday Coward, we are available for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Now, Dean Coward, you may begin once a member of our staff unmutes you and the Sergeant gives you the cue. Okay, uh, time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and committee members. Thank you for inviting us to speak today. As Vice Chancellor Maybank stated in her remarks, CUNY is providing referral services to students who indicate that they are experiencing food and housing insecurity. CUNY food pantries are currently operating at all of our senior and community colleges 
and CUNY students are able to access the food pantries at all of our CUNY institutions, regardless of their college of attendance. This was an initiative of Governor Cuomo's No Student Hungry Act. This year, more than 8,000 students has visited the CUNY food pantries where they have received grocery bags, gift cards, and grocery cards. Students who are unable to visit the campus receive direct cash transfers. Using city council funds, we were able to provide $20,000 to each community college's food pantry. CUNY's community colleges and John Jay College continue to provide a holistic set of wraparound services formerly provided by Single Stop USA. These services include benefit screening, where program staff meet with students and complete a screening that allows the student to see available services. If eligible, the staff guides the students through the process of applying for public benefits, including supplemental nutrition assistance program, temporary assistance for needy families, and women, infants, and children. Staff members work with students to identify issues and barriers that may prevent them from doing well academically, and then connect students to campus resources, co coordinate with other service providers, and monitor the student's services. Programs provide students with clothing for themselves and for their families, host clothing pop-up shops and collaborate with CUNY EDGE in seeking professional attire for employment through their Dress for Success program. Staff conduct an assessment to determine student eligibility for financial assistance and are able to provide students with emergency funds for housing, telephone bills, medical bills, transportation, textbooks, and food. Programs at times receive donations from their campus wellness and health centers and provide feminine hygiene products to provide for their students. The New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG, provides virtual financial counseling to students also. Staff conducts a full needs assessment with each student for food items and at some locations ready to eat meals. The office also oversees the food purchasing process and tracks spending. Staff conducts a full assessment with each student for healthcare enrollment and assists the student in applying for health insurance. The health and wellness office provides sexual education information to students as well as condoms, pregnancy tests, and sanitary products. Staff also refers students to the campus wellness and health centers for their services if not provided directly by the campus programs. For housing services, program staff provides referrals to students to address their housing needs. Staff refers students to shelters, rental assistance programs, public housing, and programs that can assist students facing eviction. The program staff provides free referrals that can help address students' needs. The staff refers students to New York City area programs to address childcare, housing, financial assistance, domestic violence, and other resources available to them. Within CUNY, students are referred to counseling centers, career services, wellness centers, and other offices. The Legal Aid Society provides in-person and virtual legal counseling to our students too. Staff participates in numerous events to promote the program services. These events include admission seminars, new student orientations, and student activity fairs, along with financial aid awareness events, health and wellness events, classroom presentations, and tabling in high student traffic areas. Program staff provide referrals to student parents based on individual need. The IRS trains program staff to conduct intake for students who would like to file their taxes. The staff screens students to ensure that they meet the eligibility criteria to ensure that they have, and to ensure that they have all of the necessary documents. Then a certified tax preparer prepares, reviews, and submits the student's federal and state taxes. In the spring 2020 Education Trust Report entitled Coronavirus and Educational Equity, Supporting College Students Through the Pandemic, 56% of low-income students reported skipping a meal or reducing their daily meal amounts, and only 32% of poor students indicated that they would be able to afford these basic expenses, including food. In response to the needs of our students, the programs have created their own partnerships with internal and external organizations and currently provide services beyond 
what Single Stop USA had been providing in the form of benefit screening, financial counseling, tax preparation assistance, and legal services. Overall, our student affairs liaisons report an increase in students requesting food and housing assistance. CUNY staff continue to provide housing referrals to the door, the Bowery, the Church Avenue Merchant Block Association, Catholic Charities, Part of the Solution, and other agencies. Because many, many charities will not assist students denied by HRA, our staff members have established relationships with several community agencies that provide housing assistance services, such as one-shot deals. Our campus liaisons report spending a lot of time assisting students as they navigate illegal housing eviction threats and additional scare tactics from landlords, even with an eviction moratorium in place. Through staff ad advocacy, CUNY students receive additional education about their housing and legal rights. CUNY continues to support students who need housing assistance by providing HRA application assistance, emergency grants, hotel rooms, and direct links to housing rights, such as N New York City HRA Civil Justice, Housing Court, and the Ten Tenant Prevention Task Force. Using existing resources and program services, CUNY remains committed to providing students with wraparound services that will ensure their success. Thank you. We're able to take questions um, from the committee members. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that they have a question for this panel. Chair Barron. Uh, thank you. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by several other members of the city council. Council member Ulrich was a member of the committee as well as council member Rodriguez and council member Lewis. And we're glad to have them participating. Uh, I want to thank the panel for their testimony because we know that this is a very critical issue. And it's an issue that has existed before the pandemic. So it's not just something that is a result of the pandemic, but certainly this pandemic has exacerbated the situation and called uh, us to pay attention to why we're in this situation to try to look at how we can move forward. Uh, just in terms of some background information, can you tell me what, were the, what was the enrollment at CUNY prior to the pandemic and what has been the enrollment since the pandemic has started? And have you been able to determine the impact of the pandemic on students not returning? And do you find a difference between the community level, community school level and the senior college level? Okay. Um, so what I can tell you, and I, I apologize, I, I'm welcome, not remembering. Welcome, welcome to the CUNY system. Welcome. You're just 70 days in. Do you want to welcome? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I value that. And, and I love returning to my alma mater. So I am really excited about that. You know, I went to Brooklyn College, but I'm owning all of CUNY as my alma mater. I have good sense. I was raised well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I do appreciate the welcome. Um, I don't have the, the full number at, based on the, the distribution um, prior to, but I can tell you that total enrollment declined by about 1,900 students at our senior colleges and by about 14,100 students at our community college colleges. About 40% of the decline at the community colleges is, is is explained by fewer high school students enrolling in college programs. So I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, there's basically been no change in the proportion of degree seeking undergraduates and stu um, students enrolled as full-time and part-time. We haven't seen any um, real, any significant differences there. Um, there have been no significant changes in the proportion of undergraduate students who are of a specific race, ethnicity, or gender either. So it's been kind of um, level across all uh, races and ethnicities. Well, um, I'm trying to understand how you can give me the figures for the decline at the community and senior colleges. You said 14,000 at community? Correct. 
and 1900? Correct. Fine. Uh, and how does that translate then into no impact on full-time and part-time or did I misunderstand what you were saying? Um, based on the information that I was provided, the proportions remain the same. Um, I'm trying to, to, to uh, go through and make sure I have okay. all of that correct. So. so there's no proportional difference between- Correct. Okay, I got it. Correct, it's and, proportional. Okay, and in terms of uh, the information, I would love to have that disaggregated. You did okay. That you did not see any differences according to uh, race, ethnicity. So I'd like to get the figures uh, disaggregated for. I, I will make sure that we provide that to you, your okay. person there. And so, what do you expect? This was a difference from the fall uh, 2020 enrollment. What do you expect, or what are your projections, or what indicators do you have? for the fall 2021 or even the summer 2021 uh, semester? So we, we believe that enrollment at the community colleges will continue to decline, although that might be offset by some high school enrollment um, in the programs that are at the colleges. And enrollment at the senior colleges will remain about flat. But we'll, you know, we'll be monitoring that and we're looking at uh, what is happening for spring even now um, in terms of what we anticipate will happen in a few weeks. Did you notice that uh, there was also the same type of decline in the uh, high schools that are partnered with colleges? There are several of those schools. And did you notice that there was a decline from what had been uh, noted in the past? I'm not prepared to speak to that, but I'm making a note to check against and see if there is comparable decline because it, it would make sense, you know, and certainly everyone's being impacted in similar ways and in their ability to sustain being in the academic spaces, whether high school or otherwise. So we will look at that com comparison. Do you have a way of identifying uh, the reason why students have dropped out, uh, don't return? Is there any way to capture that data as to uh, why students are not returning? Not really. Um, you know, we didn't anticipate answering those kinds, ha having to answer those kinds of questions. But one of the things that we are doing it with our reinvigoration of our survey, we will be asking more directly about those questions that kind of thing, you know, what caused you to, and as I said, with the um, survey that Nick Frudenberg and his group did, they were attributing the impact of COVID on their uh, needing to stop out or on their being distracted even from their ability to pursue their academics. And so there are all kinds of opportunities for us to figure out how we step in and support students so that they can continue. Um, and not have that experience. As students uh, leave, do you have a document, a survey, or a questionnaire that you send or submit or ask them to complete? Or would this be something new now that CUNY would be just instituting uh, at this time? There may be some campuses that um, have that opportunity. It is not centralized or standardized in any particular way. I believe that, you know, it, as we, keep talking about the unprecedented experiences that are associated with COVID-19, we have to have unprecedented response. And I believe that whether or not we would have asked in the past is irrelevant. It is whether or not we need to ask going forward. And I believe we need to do that. We need to be about the business of understanding the impact of life on our, our students given who they are, and as I had indicated, they, they come against the odds in so many circumstances that we need to be positioned to truly understand the impact of life, living, and circumstance on our students. How do we identify those students who in fact are housing insecure or in fact homeless? How do we collect that? How do we know who those students are? How do we collect that data? Right now, we aren't tracking that in a regular way. One of the things we have started to do is to look at the FAFSA data for students who self-identify as homeless. So we're trying to figure out how we get our arms around that 
and really start to be um, more directive in trying to ask students to let us know so that we can be of benefit to them. Not to be in their business, not to get in their way, not to, to have that information wholesaled around, but more from the perspective of knowing what we need to do to ramp up in response. So students self-identify, is how do they self-identify, do they? Some, some students um, may indicate that to their institution, but others may indicate it in, um, in providing uh, shelter addresses as a part of the information that they give or some temporary relationship. And so we're, we're mining what we know about our students from our CUNY first perspective to figure out what we then can determine based on um, those, those opportunities they have. So my next question is, how does a student know where to go to self-identify? And is there a flag or an indicator uh, that, uh, that someone on staff sees to let us know, oh, this is a student that's living in a shelter? I mean, a student may indicate an address, may know to be a shelter, but it's on an application on a piece of paper which gets put, probably not on paper, it's probably it's not here. <laughs> Dating but it's in, it's in the system. <laughs> um, so, someone would target that. So I'm going to ask Sunday. Do you know if there is a particular place? I just I am not familiar, um, Chairperson Barron, with exactly how that is done, and we will detail that for you in our follow up information. But I understand that we had some ability to to know that these students had self identified in some way. So we were using that as our, um, our certain information. But I, I agree that if we, can, uh, if we can let students know, here's an opportunity for you to tell us. Now, whether or not you opt to is up to you, but here's, here's where you can tell us this information so that we can follow up. Very often it's a campus-based um, engagement and people tend to know because they know their students. You know, student affairs folks are, as I tell students very often, I'm nosy, let me in, you know, just, just feed, feed that nosiness for me so that I can be of support to you. And I do that jokingly, but you know, it's to take the edge off of some things and let them feel like somebody's paying attention. Mm -hmm. So I know that happens on campuses. And Sunday, I don't know if you know if there's a particular place where that can be noted. Most often than it is, they do self-report, but typically with programs that they may be affiliated with, whether it's College Discovery, SEEK, ASAP, um, any affiliation they have, they may inform instructors who then inform someone in student affairs. And we then direct them to the services. Students who utilize our food pantries, they're asked these things about homelessness. They're not just coming in to get food. We then use that space to say, we have these available services. Every program has uh, referrals, brochures that they give to them. But not only that, they will literally walk them to places, call people on, their, on the student's behalf. So while it's informal, we formalized it once they, they reach your door or someone brings them. And then we use peer student advocates to really direct students. Um, I know with uh, Professor Nick Kronenberg, he really has a student peer program and utilizes those students because there's that, that gap between us as staff and, and faculty where you have your peers come in and say, it's okay. There's no stigma attached to being homeless or food insecure. And here are resources that you can use. And so we table in very high um, places. Uh, we go to, to where the students are. And now that we're virtually, we make sure that it's on the website so students can get that information and that's directed to them in the brochures that we have also. Thank you. Uh, so it appears that both the uh, 2018 um, hashtag real college survey, which had 21 respondents. Uh, 21,000. Say again? 21,000. Thank you, 21,000. Uh, that was a CUNY student survey experience. And the 2018 had almost 22,000, uh, which was administered uh, to those CUNY students. How does CUNY account for the difference in data, meaning the rate at which homelessness, according to the SES, is 5%, uh, 
whereas the 2018 hashtag real college survey reports 11 to 14 percent rate of homelessness. So I did have a chance to follow up on that concern and I'm gonna share with you what I've learned. Um, and so the SES questionnaire only asks two questions pertaining to homelessness mm -hmm. and housing insecurity. Do you have a regular and adequate place to sleep? It's a yes or no question. And how often were you worried about having enough money to pay rent or housing costs? And it's on, that's on a Likert scale of never to always. 5% of students elected yes to the direct homelessness item out of 25% and 25% um, indicated usually or always. On the Likert scale of security and an additional 29% stated sometimes. This, this information demonstrated that directly asking about homelessness does not capture the whole truth of student experience. The Hope Center, who does the uh, hashtag real college survey, believes that students are hesitant to self-identify as homeless. Only 3% of their population did so, lower than the 5% for SES. Um, and they used a nine item scale to target experiences of homelessness and found an additional 11% of students that did not identify as homeless outright, but experienced homelessness in the form of temporary living with friends or family, or, or what a lot of us refer to as couch surfing and other insecure situations. So we have operationally used the 5% from the SES direct question and the 14% from the real college report as boundaries for the true experience of homelessness at CUNY. Um, at lower bounds, we, we estimate 5% of CUNY students are homeless and at upper bounds, 14% are. And that's the way we use that information. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that it could have also been a different population of students who were responding. Um, it, could, you know, it could have turned over. And so we have to keep that part in mind as well. The previous SESs included questions about socioeconomic status. Why doesn't the 2018 SES include those questions? Um, I can't directly respond to that one, but um, I know that they've tried to balance the information needs at the university with the survey experiences of students and trying to make sure that we get the information. Um, we can re-examine that section of the survey for the next administration because we will be doing that again. Um, I have a question you talked about, uh, I think you called it the CUNY Student Thriving or Rising Think Tank. Oh, the and thriving, about thriving. Okay, think tank. And it's going to focus on create, creative, innovative programs, responses, and having, who are, the, who are the people who are serving on that? Who are the members of that? Okay, so it is not yet formed and it is something that I'm bringing as a concept in my 70 days. And so we gotta get it, we've gotta get it moving. But the idea is to take researchers across the CUNY system, like Nick Frudenberg and others that work with the Healthy um, CUNY uh, initiative and bring them in direct connection with the practitioners in the student affairs offices. So it is the people who have the immediate contact with students working with those who explore what it is that's happening, do the research, create the data that help us to understand what's the phenomena and the experiences that happen in some way so that we build real, real responses in real time, recognizing the importance of responding quickly. Because all too often research is done and it takes time to get that done. And then you know we have to figure out who's doing the analysis and how they're applying that information. The think tank is about putting people together in same space to work on the issues and put it, keeping it ever before them in a way that causes them to respond. Our students deserve that. Our students need that. 
And I'm committed to making sure that we are doing what is necessary to ensure optimal opportunities for our students to fulfill their goals. Um, do you env envision that there will also be representatives from the student body that will be? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. I, I, I don't breathe without students, <laughs> chairperson Barron. It's like, and, and often I'm told they, they keep me young, so I'm going to keep them around for a long time. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the whole idea is, is to use all levels of this concept to engage students. So we want to have an arm that is undergraduate research so that students from our community colleges and from our um, senior colleges all, also get the opportunity to start to learn about how you use data to solve problems and that they get that training and that understanding along the way. But to also have the voices of the students who need the resources to be a part of that discussion. We don't talk to each other enough. We decide that we sit and we know what to do. I can't know what to do for a 17 year old from their perspective. I was 17 at some point, but I'm a little ways away from that. I'm not gonna talk about how far, but I can't know the experience right now. And life is so different for a 17 year old now than it was when I was, you know, living in Esplanade Gardens and trying to, you know, get through and make things happen in that context. So I, I believe that we have to listen. We have to be open to the experience of students and make sure that we are responding to their needs rather than our desires. So it is critical to have student engagement. I think that's, I'm glad to know that that's a, focus um, uh, on the habit, having that population from their perspective, they're living through it and not yes. from our perspective, a generation or two past where they are. Right. In terms of the number of students who are presently living on campus at CUNY, in housing developments, housing facilities at CUNY, what's that number again? Um, so currently we're right around, I, I think we have about three to 400. Um, Sunday, do you know the exact number? I, I don't, don't know if I, I have can that. get the exact number. I can get that. I don't know. And what is the location where these students are housed? Is it just two sites where they are housed? No, no. So the, the halls are, are open at this point. And um, so we had started prior to the pandemic with um, 3,171 beds in all of the residence halls um, and, and apartments. And I know I have a chart and if I can pull it up, I will, I will see if I can do that. And I may have to come back to that one for you, um, Chairperson Barron, because I, I have to get into my email and pull up that chart to take a look at where, where the numbers are currently. Um, but uh, we have over 3000 beds available. And we had, when in de-densifying, that was what we needed to do. We couldn't have, you know, all of the students living in that space. And so we, prior to the pandemic, we would see um, 10 to 20% um, vacancy rates. But post-pandemic, the vacancy rate has been on average at 76%. And that because we needed to reduce the number of beds to ensure student safety and to comply with social distancing guidelines. And so all of that contributes to that. Um, so we'll get those numbers for you. And if I can, I'll do it while we're on. Thank you. In terms of talking about the reality of the society in which we're living and the systemic racism that exists. At one point, I was informed that students who were living, I believe it was the students who were uh, students in the system for foster care, were living at a campus facility on Staten Island. And there were several incidents which the students felt were discriminatory. So again, you're just 70 days in but I wanted to understand what CUNY is doing to ensure that whatever um, programs or initiatives need to be in place, that they are put in place. And I'm not trying to characterize any borough 
with any kind of uh, next description. But certainly we know that there are some communities where there are more instances of uh, racial tensions than in other communities. So what is CUNY, I would like you to find out or think about or contemplate and let us know what CUNY is doing to sensitize communities to a different population from what they might normally have interacted with and to make sure that there are protections for those students that are in those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we take seriously our responsibility for having welcomed students in care into the experience with intent and with specific regard for a program. And so we do have a responsibility then to make certain that they know they belong, they know they are welcome, and they know they are safe. And so, yes, we do need to be certain that we keep track of what it is that's happening, make sure that, you know, if they're out and about in community, they are not feeling that they are other in that experience and in that space. They belong. And we need to make sure that we are sending clear messages about our welcoming students into space and place and the expectation that those who partner with us support that effort as well. And you know, the, unfortunately, unfortunately, life is what it is and the racial injustice that we experience in our cities and in our, our, our communities is real. And so we need to be certain that we are stepping up and advocating and making clear our position as the university system, as a college in that community, as a partner in a community to make sure that we send clear messages. So I fully agree and hear what you are saying and know that we need to pay attention to that concern and we'll make certain that we are considering the impact of the, the tensions that exist in our country is so evident last week um, so that we can make certain they know what to do in those circumstances and we are there to support them. So I appreciate you raising it. Yes, thank you. I've, I've listened to your testimony and, and, and that of uh, Dr. Coward. And I heard all of the support that CUNY is trying to give the students to help them be successful in their academic careers. You talked about the pantries. And of course we know that pantries and homelessness are very much uh, parallel tracks. Yes. That's good to know that that's also an opportunity for students to be able to reach out for the support talked about legal aid advice for students who might be uh, harassed by landlords, you know, un, uh, unscrupulous landlords. You talked about student wellness and you talked about providing all of those services which had been provided by single stop now being provided via CUNY, uh, helping students to be screened, go through the screening for benefits that they might be entitled to. You also spoke about one shots and I think you also mentioned there may be grants that might be available to students. What is CUNY's anticipation and preparation for that date in June of this year when there will be, uh, the sunset will occur for the moratoriums on evictions? People who have not been able to perhaps pay their rent now have a huge bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The bill people, I don't know that people are really uh, practicing that it's not saying that you don't have to pay. It's just saying you don't have to pay it now. You don't have to pay it yet. That's it. That's it. Exactly. So what, what plans or what provisions or what uh, support or what outreach is Kenny doing to perhaps have the governor consider other types of, uh, and this I guess is a great time now because they're going to be doing the budget process and the budget. Mm -hmm. and what would you think should be our position? I'm saying now because I'm representing that interest of CUNY also to mm -hmm. the legislature. While we know that there have been a great reduction in the uh, income that the city and the state budgets will have, what 
do you think we should plan to ask for the governor in particular, but the mayor as well, to make provisions economically for those who are going to have to pay that rent bill? What kind of support do you think we can ask the governor for? And I'm saying that because we're getting into that budget season. And I, while I was in the assembly, did ask my colleagues to, uh, you know, figure out how we can get the governor to increase the taxing, the tax for the super rich, and how we can have the governor get back to the, the uh, stock transfer tax, which we give right back to, to the um, to the stock market. So those are kinds of big ticket items which can be done. But do you have any kinds of ideas about what we can do for that time when the moratorium will expire? I'm gonna give Sunday a chance to respond to this as well in terms of resources we might refer to. But I, I just, I wanna say that I think from a position of advocacy, mm -hmm. I understand that landlords mm -hmm. are people too. And so they're looking to be paid. So I, I'm not going to ignore that and act as though we just make it go away. But I do believe we need opportunities and we need to advocate within the context of whatever the stimulus resources are or whatever other federal dollars may come to, into play, that we need to be in a position to advocate that those resources, because they are one-time resources, be made available. We have the benefit within the um, higher education sector to know that we can give resources directly to students. Now, they then have to make the, the difficult choice to say, yes, I'm using this money for this, that, or the other thing. It's money given to them to make the decision. And they then have to decide that they are paying rent or they are buying um, the medications their children may need or you know, doing whatever has, has backed up for them as expenses in this time frame, or that they're paying their bill at the City University of New York. So the resources made available, um, then, then leave them to make a decision. And so I believe we need to be in a position to stimulate their ability to pay the things that have been, that, that are now outstanding. And however we advocate that, I'm going to leave you would know better than I the things that you need to ask for, like the stop transfer tax and all that. You, you know better than I. I don't know all of the, the tools at our disposal, and we certainly can partner to make that happen. And so I, I appreciate that you are such a staunch advocate for CUNY and for the things that are necessary at the city and state levels. And so we may need to, to figure out what the opportunities are, what the special um, funds are and what the one-time opportunities are to reduce the debt and the and the the um, the bills the the rent bills that are, that are left standing. So Sunday, I don't know if you want to talk about the other things that we might be able to use in terms of referrals. I, I think you said it best, and I'll add some more. But um, Chair. Um, person Barron, I know that we, we follow your lead on that advocacy and we actually reach that down to our students and make sure that they know how to advocate for themselves. So we, we are really spending a lot of time teaching them how to speak to landlords, what to ask for, see what you can work out in advance. And, and also the tenants associations, the housing courts and, and staying with our legal aid, the assistance that we receive with them and having students bring forth how much they already owe. I mean, some students are waiting to hear that they'll, their debt will be erased, but as VC Maybank said, there are landlords who need funding oh, also. Definitely. And so I know that that as the advocacy continues from multiple people and, and spaces that those voices will rise up to the legislature and to all the people that need to, to make the decisions to help students who really need the assistance. And also just people in the city, in New York, who. Who are facing homelessness and, and don't have food to eat. We have to take care of those. And so we look to partner, but we definitely look for guidance from, from y'all who are in this realm to assist. And, and I, this gives me an opportunity to uh, get in one of my uh, 
pri primary objectives, which is to have CUNY return to no tuition. Uh, that was how I was able to go to college. But at that time, if you had met the requirements for entry, you did not have to pay tuition. Of course, you had to do all the other things, the textbooks, the travel, food, and all of that. But uh, so this is a grand opportunity for us to stop tuition and look how we can roll back tuition and get back to uh, free tuition for CUNY. Um, almost finished with the questions. And if there are other council members who have questions, I'll be notified and give them an opportunity to speak as well. So of course our objective is to have students to be successful in their academic pursuit. And how many laptops or tablets has CUNY distributed to students during the pandemic? I do have that information. Give me a second to locate it. Um, and then while doing that, uh, do we know if the students who have received these devices have internet access? Because we are certainly know, finding out that that's a major problem. Uh, as the Department of Education in New York City has distributed devices, but students uh, the students don't have internet access. And so, so mm -hmm. yeah, and, and that's gonna, that, you know, that digital divide that we know exists, um, whether it be based on socioeconomic levels or race, ethnicity, and just what, you know, community and how communities are wired or not and how they are sustained, all of those things come into play. But let me give you the numbers first. So CUNY distributed more than 33,000 iPads and Chromebooks to students, including non-degree students to support okay. their learning needs as part of the university's pivot to distance learning. They all, we also procured 4,000 mobile broadband hotspots to support students who had unreliable or no internet access at home. Um, so, you know, we, we did what we could with what we had, you know, what was available, because one of the things that I know I experienced even um, outside of the New York area was there came a time when you couldn't get a hotspot. You couldn't find one. Um, because, because they were so, you know, being snapped up so quickly in, in so many different ways. So um, we, we did what we could in terms of those, those opportunities, but 56% 50 of those responding to a CUNY technology needs survey said that they do not, um, that they do most of their coursework at home. And 91% of the respondents said that they have somewhat or very reliable internet access at home. 1% reported having no access to the internet at all. And 2% said very unreliable um, access. Um, and so, and, and then 5% had unreliable access. So of the respondents that do not do their coursework at home, 88% said that they somewhat had reliable to very reliable internet access, which, you know, the, and this, this is good. I mean, but, but still when, if it's 2%, it's 2% too many for me because it's somebody who can't do what they need to do. And so we, we do need to figure out what's happening in, in that situation specifically, but nearly 2% um, reported having uh, no access to the internet where they do their coursework and 3% had unreliable and 7%, I'm sorry, had very unreliable and 7% had unreliable access. So it's, it's on the lower uh, percentages of those numbers, but still it's, there's a need. There's a need and students are trying to find alternative places to do work. And libraries aren't open because of right. the social yeah. distancing and so forth. So there's a need. The students, what part, what percentage of study, of CUNY students are living in shelter? And what kind of provisions are made so that the devices that they get 
uh, can be enabled and make sure that they can get connected. Uh, Sunday, can, do you have a sense of numbers for that? I don't, but I'd have that written down to get a response okay. back. But I know that some of the shelters don't have Wi-Fi or allow Wi-Fi right. inside. And so right. our students do struggle with that. In the past, when the libraries were open, they would go there to use the services. Some are literally would, would sit outside of there with, through the pandemic, but that is a challenge for students once they go in. So they'll find other places to stay and use uh, a Starbucks and not to name places, but they'll find free Wi-Fi so that they can do their work. Uh, outside of the shelter before going in. But I, I can look, I'm not sure that we have the actual number because a lot of it is self-reported. Right. But I can ask through financial aid with the FAFSA information. Yes, and some of those- with That I'm indicator that we're gonna see for a pop-up, oh, that's a shelter address. So mm -hmm. we'll be able to, to get some of that, even though it's self-identified, yes. Yes. And the, the reality is that, you know, it was fine in the fall. We're in the winter. Mm -hmm. And so people running around trying to find where they can connect, you know, because there's a um, there's a resource and I, I'm blocking on the name of it, but wherever um, college campuses are, there's a way that you can connect. And, as, you know, as long as you have a, a college related address. Mm -hmm. And so if you are within range and they have a strong enough signal, you can be outside and not, not have to be in a building and still pick up a connection. But it's winter time. And so we have to be practical about what's what's right. reasonable and how students are faring under, you know, significant experiences right now that, that keep them from being able to do what they need to do. And do uh, just two more questions basically. Do community college students have access to campus sponsored housing? They do. Uh, college they do. students as well. So what, what happens is um, students who are associated with a campus, with a home campus, yeah. have first priority in the residence halls. But three of the residence halls okay. permit students from across CUNY um, to reside there. And that's Queens College, City College, and the Graduate Center for graduate students. So um, students from the community colleges, can live in the other residence hall. John Jay also um, supports some of the dorm project students in addition to Queens College and Hunter College. So um, they have that opportunity at those three locations to- so we to expect that in the budget moving forward that CUNY will be advancing, that there will be increases in those programs that support uh, the step offer support and finances and resources to those students. Can we expect that, that those programs will be increased in their funding since we understand that this is such a critical issue? Are you specifically talking about the foster care type initiatives or? Well, uh, foster care, uh, the housing. We know that as you mentioned, city council uh, allocated money to each campus and we hope that we'll be able to do that again as we move forward, but particularly those uh, programs that are gonna support students that are housing insecure or homeless. Can we expect that CUNY is going to reflect that need in their budget projections for this year? I think we will. Okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, you know, in, in all honesty, um, yes, we, we, we recognize the importance of this. We recognize that, again, you know, the, the pandemic has magnified mm -hmm. the, the situations that are happening, that were already happening. And so it does cause us to now pay attention in a different way because more students are impacted. And so we do have to position ourselves to find the resources to connect with the um, the organizations that do this already, it's not just on us to do it. And so right. that's the part that I pay attention to, that we, we need to be in our lane for our expertise, expertise, and we need to allow others to be in the lane for their expertise. And we need to blur the boundaries between education and social services in such a way that we don't allow people to fall through the cracks. 
Thank you. And we, bond, we bond together. And uh, for my final question, I think, uh, previously for the fall 2019 and spring 2019 semesters, CUNY was planning to create a pilot program to provide on-campus residence hall housing with wraparound services to students who were homeless or at imminent risk of losing their current housing. And at that time, CUNY expected to serve 24 students each semester for a total of 48 students over the academic year. So what was the success of that pilot program? How were students identified for that program? Unfortunately, there was not funding for that program. So we are looking to partner and to figure out how we can do that. The expectation for that number is that it would be right around $700,000 to do that. But the pilot did not happen because there was not sufficient funding to make that happen. Um, so um, when I learned of this, it is certainly top of mind for me. It is uh, based on a model out of California where that was very successful, um, the Bruin Shelter. And I can certainly share that information with you as well. I was familiar with that from, from my former position as well. And so um, I'm all about trying to move that forward. We are looking for partners. And so did the extent to which you can advocate to support us in this, we will accept that come alongside and help. So please know that, that we're putting out that call. <laughs> to have that happen and um, look forward to, to being able to do this because I think, it's, I think it's the right thing. And it'll give us so much information from a pilot of 48 to how we can extend to help and support those in need in this way. So thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna thank this panel for coming and for presenting your testimony and look forward to the responses to the questions which we've asked, which require a little bit more research. Uh, thank you once again, and at this time, I will turn it back to the moderator, who will call, who will ask if there are council members with questions, or call the next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. As a quick reminder to the council members, if you have any questions, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and we will call you in the order of hands raised. Seeing no hands raised at this time, we will move on to the first public panel of this hearing. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call in, up individuals and in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Giovanni Piquant, the chair of the University Student Senate, Walik Boone from the Professional Staff Congress, Sharon Persinger from, from the Professional Staff Congress, and Helen Frank also from the Professional Staff Congress. I will now call on Ms. Peacock. Thank you. Starts now. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee on City Council. Thank you for holding this hearing and staff members who are behind the scenes doing work. My name is Giovanni Piquant. I serve as the chairwoman of the University Student Senate, which is the student body of all 25 CUNY campuses at the City University of New York. Today we are here to talk about housing insecurity with our CUNY students, in regards to our CUNY students. It is no secret that housing insecurity is one of the pivotal issues that affect our everyday lives. Uniquely urban, uniquely distinct to our city university students of New York, New York City is such an urban area and housing is no secret that we are in a crisis here. With the COVID-19 pandemic that has ravished our students insanely, housing insecurity and food insecurity and just instability just in general have affected our students a lot. It is no secret that we have seen an influx of Americans going back to school nationwide, but the graduation rates with that influx and in high increase have still stayed staggered because of the lack of support services for us to get through higher education in academia. 
we are, it is no secret that students are falling behind the cracks because of the lack of support that they are receiving. And with testimony previously presented by CUNY administration, it is no secret that we are seeing black and brown students are disproportionately affected by housing and food insecurity. Systemic racism plays such a huge role in how students receive the services that they can get. It plays a huge role in the investment that we have in our university. We've been here many times before. I've been, we've testified to the Higher Education Committee many times before, and we know the issue is funding. We know we do not have the resources to give our students so they can go on and thrive and have what they need. We have programs such as Single Stop that screen students for resources that they may need, such as SNAP, opportunity programs, financial aid, federal financial aid, TAP, but it is so important that if we do not have these programs on every single campus, we do not have these resources for every student to have at their fingertips, we will have students fall through the crack. I'm urging, and students across CUNY and just many New Yorkers just in general are urging members of the council to advocate and expand and invest in the City University of New York. Not only just invest in our university, but invest in the programs that help our students thrive. Invest in programs such as Single Stop to provide students with these resources. As we know, the eviction momentarium will be ending in June and we need a plan. And also calling on the university to have a more intentional approach of how we are tracking these students. Students who have left during the COVID-19 pandemic in those dormitories, where are they now? How are they doing? What is the academic standing for those students? Because without following through, we are not doing our moral obligations for I'm the students at the University of New York. So today, as the representative of all 25 campuses of CUNY, a quarter million students. We are calling on the city council and elected officials all across New York to look at ways of increasing revenue, to look at ways we can directly put revenue back into the City University of New York and help fund these programs that help our students thrive. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Boone. Time starts now. Go ahead, time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Wally Boone. I wanna thank Chair, Chair Berman and the rest of the committee for having me here. Um, providing basic needs to mar marginalized college students. The City University of New York should establish a single point of entry office on each of their campuses because college students are impacted negatively when their basic needs are not met. Leadership is essential to end homelessness for college students and finding them stable housing because they view a higher education degree as a stepping stone out of poverty. There's approximately 1.5 million people that go homeless on a single night, which has a series of lasting effects on their health, personal development, and well being. Among those homeless are CUNY students. Marginalized CUNY students should have the same opportunity and resources to complete their degree as stable students. The US Government Accountability Office report that students faced with housing instability and food insecurity will have challenges in the pursuit of a college degree. In order to assist students, CUNY need to establish a single point of entry office that will engage the students and assess their pressing issues. However, some colleges find it difficult to find homeless and housing unstable students because they do not have the data, tools to track the students or students unwilling to self-disclose because of the embarrassment of their housing status. Without resources being provided to homeless and housing insecure students, it would make it much harder for them to attain a degree. I've been working in higher education, Meg Evers College for the past 13 years and have encountered numerous students whose basic needs were not being met. As a result, students drop out of school, their grades have been impacted and some graduate despite the circumstances. For example, a 18 year old student was kicked out of her mother's house and began sleeping on the train. She, she was in her first year of college. Moreover, she informed me that her mother used to kick her out while she was in high school because her mother's boyfriend was making unprovoked advances. When she informed her mother, her mother did not believe her. Student eventually went into a shelter, withdrew from all her classes because she was not able to focus. Homelessness could cause traumatized experience for homeless college students that can affect their well being. CUNY should be aware of how experiencing trauma affects college students. My research has directed me to determine that what I believe to be most essential questions regarding this issue. 
We must engage, assess, and empower homeless and housing instability students to come out of the shadows and seek services that are needed to complete their degree. And in homelessness for college, for CUNY students and providing basic needs as they pursue their academic success is not an easy task or quick fix. In order to end this wicked problem, you first have to identify the students who are homeless or housing insecure. I know it's often hard to identify homeless youth in a college environment because as I alluded to, they hide in the shadows to avoid embarrassment. In conclusion, a single point of entry office that centralized the necessary resources and data of homeless and housing unstable and food insecure student is the most proficient way to address this basic needs. Time has ended. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Dr. Persinger. Good morning, Chair Barron, members of the Council Committee on Higher Education, other council members. Thank you, Chair Barron, for holding the hearing and for allowing us to speak. Um, I'm Sharon Persinger. I am the treasurer of the PSC, the, the union that represents CUNY's faculty and staff. So I'm speaking on behalf of the PSC. Even before COVID landed in New York City last year, it was estimated that one out of 10 students at CUNY were housing insecure. This tragic statistic is made worse by the fact that under COVID, CUNY students have been harder, hit harder than students at other colleges. Even before the COVID crisis, more than 60% of CUNY students had a family income of less than $30,000 their lives were already financially precarious. Since COVID, 40% of CUNY students have lost their jobs due to COVID. Their financial insecurity has been compounded. Students should not be hindered from accessing public higher education because of society's structural failures. People have a right to housing, people have a right to education to help them meet their goals. So watching students struggle at the same time with finishing college and finding a place to sleep, that is doubly detestable. Um, students rely on PSC members like the ones you'll hear from today, not only to help them navigate college situations like class registration, but also to keep them enrolled and on track when they face more fundamental challenges like housing security. Um, I'll let the counselors give you the details of the work that they do. Many of the programs that offer critical support to students are often the first on the budgetary cutting block. CUNY's core of advisors and mental health counselors is too small and vastly under-resourced. Thanks to the council's effort, funding for ASAP with its strong system of support for ASAP students was restored last year. But we're concerned about the upcoming budget fight. Will ASAP be up for cuts? What about programs like Seek and College Discovery? CUNY's mental health counselors are stretched to the limit. What about funding for counseling? The city can and should be investing more in student support services at CUNY colleges. As always, it's a question of priority. CUNY and the students that it serves should be a higher budget priority. We appreciate your leadership today to hold this hearing not only because it gives a voice to students, but we hope that it will lead the council to prioritize CUNY budget demands as we head into what is expected to be an especially challenging budget negotiations. Amen. Thanks very much. My apologies, Dr. Persinger. Next, we will hear from Ms. Frank. Time starts now. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and thanks, uh, Chair Bar um, Barron and Vice Chancellor Maybank. Thanks and welcome to New York City uh, again. Um, I'm a counselor with New York City uh, Counseling Services Center. And I think I, I've, I'm, I'm here to sort of um, give good news about this whole issue. Um, we've been talking about all of the needs and we've been talking about 
of what's liking, but I, I think I want to talk about some of the things that are good. I've been working as a counselor for 30 years. And uh, one of the reasons I have not retired <laughs> uh, 10 years ago when I probably should have is because I'm, I'm so inspired by our students. I'm ins inspired by this work. Uh, I went to an HBCU and uh, had a wonderful college experience. And I always hoping to give that same experience to students who are in CUNY. And, um, in the 30 years I've worked, homelessness and housing insecurity has always been an issue, always been an issue. And we are talking a lot about mental health and you know they go hand in hand. If someone does not have a safe place to live, how can we expect them to have good mental health? I mean, housing insecurity, food insecurity, causes depression, it causes despair, it causes hopelessness. But even with these things happening, our students are persevering and they persist. And I'm always awed by the fact that they can persist. And it's, it's just amazing uh, how um, we can all work together. And, and in my counseling center, we constantly struggle with trying to find um, ways to help students who are homeless and uh, and how to, even in this period of COVID, how can you find a good place to study when there are six people in your family, you know, four of them are using the computer and you don't have the time. So we are constantly talking to each other and saying, you know, oh, why don't you go to bed earlier than everyone else, wake up at three o'clock in the morning, set your alarm and use the computer at that time when no one else is using it. And sometimes students come in, come up with their own kinds of ways of sort of navigating this whole difficult period that we're in. Um, and we have to think about our professors. Um, I have professors calling me and saying, a student is sleeping in class, why? The student comes to me, I'm sleeping in class because I haven't slept because I'm sleeping on the subway. So we have our professors who are helping to identify in sort of uh, not a direct way because they don't know what the situation is. But once the student presents to counseling, then we find out that this student is homeless. And as people have said, yes, students are very reluctant to identify the fact that they're homeless. Some of them feel it's embarrassing. We have a cohort that we've been working with for these, for, and myself for 30 years, single parents, it's a big issue. Immigrant students is a very big issue that, that we haven't really talked a lot about. We have students who are sent to the United States to get an education by their parents, and they have made plans for that student to live with, with relatives or friends. And once the student gets here, things change. Some students are almost put into sort of an indentured servitude kind of situation, which becomes untenable and they leave. Therefore, they become homeless and can't go back home for a number of reasons. That's a group of students that I have been challenged uh, with in terms of trying to find places to, to, to live. Uh, we have our, as someone talked about earlier, LGBTQ students who have been thrown out of their homes once they uh, identify. And uh, we also have the aged uh, out foster care students who once they age out of foster care have a difficult uh, time finding um, places to live. But we have been really working hard to find students and, and the persistence of, of our students in CUNY um, is is just is, is the highest form of um, of of persistence in terms of looking at what they have to deal with in this challenging time. Uh, but even before COVID, they were still persisting, and uh, we have to give them credit for using all of these things. Of course, we need more. We need funding. We need um, 
dormitories. I wish we had some clearinghouse uh, from all of the dormitories we have within the CUNY system, if we could have some way of knowing when there are vacancies. Uh, is there a vacancy at John Jay so that, so that we know of a student who is in need of, of a home? I mean, I have uh, at some point in my life been so desperate, I've played the lottery thinking if I win, I can buy a building and house uh, students who are homeless. Uh, that's kind of the desperation on my part. So, but I mean, there, there's good news and I'm here to say that there's, there's bad news, but there's also good news about the re resiliency of our students here in CUNY. So, but we have to continue to give them uh, the kind of support we need. And that's where we need funding. Funding is, 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 is crucial in terms of giving them the kind of resources, and we have resources. We have a wonderful program um, that's relatively new, the, the Petrie Grant for students mm. who are in um, jeopardy of being evicted and they can apply for this grant and get their back rent paid. Uh, of course, it's not a huge program. There's not a lot of money in the program, but it has some help. So if we start to identify those kinds of programs, then I, I think we uh, we can do better by our students. I think it's my time up yeah. <laughs> because I go on and on, I'm sorry. So thank you for having me and thanks for everyone who's doing everything to really help, help students in the city university system. Thank you so much. We appreciate the panel for coming and, and sharing their positions and offering ideas. Um, I myself just had some technical, I got kicked off in that part of the house where so I had to shift to another part of the house. So imagine a student not being able to maintain a connection and not having an alternative spot that they can go to for that. So that certainly is an issue that's exacerbated by this uh, pandemic and the lack of uh, connection. There were several points that were raised by this panel. And for Ms. Picant, I wanna ask you particularly how do you feel your school has supported those persons who are experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity? We understand, we heard information about their using single stop approach, but how do you feel that has, uh, that has manifested itself in our students actually being able to um, utilize that? Well, I go to City Tech, so um, as you know, the single stop offices are different on, it, some campuses have it, some campuses don't. Um, but what I would say is that they have done a good job in terms of intentions, in terms of including us in the conversations of how the plans are going to be rolled out, what are we looking at. But the conversation always boils down to we don't have any money, and it's either we do this or we don't do this, and um, we need both. And we're always at that tug of war and we, students are food insecure, but we also need counseling services. Students also need um, Wi-Fi hotspots and technology. And it, it's always, I feel like at, the, at CUNY, we always have to pick one out of all that we need. Mm -hmm. And it hurts us because we do need all because it is our moral compass. And if we do not have all of the resources that we need to thrive, we are lacking in some areas. We may make advances in one area, but then we are lacking in another area. For example, at City Tech, we are doing great advances in regards to our food pantry. The SJ started up and we did a pop of food pantry. And the spring semester, there, there will be an actual physical pantry. Uh, but then we are in a crisis in terms of our counseling, telecounseling services. Mm -hmm. How can we do that? We don't have enough money for that. Yes, we can do this, but we can offer students that, but not all the students. And it's all, it, it, it's very, it, it puts us in a situation of we cannot have the resources that we need because this is a constant cycle of lack of investment in CUNY. And I think in order for us to fix this, there needs to be intentional approach to the City University of New York. It's not just when it's budget se se season. Right. Let's just allocate some money because we need to have an intentional approach to figure out, yes, we want to allocate money, but are we mitigating future issues that are happening, such as the pandemic? We didn't see the pandemic coming. 
And yes, we've invested in CUNY and now that money had to go somewhere else. So um, yes, there has been intentional help, but we are still feeling the, the, the lapses and what we need. Right, and uh, I think your point is uh, highlighted by saying, well, we didn't plan for the pandemic. We knew it was coming. I've been reading uh, information and books that said, no, it was predicted that it would come and we didn't make preparation. So that same approach needs to be applied. We know that there are students who are homeless or insecure how, uh, in, their, in their housing situation. We need to plan for that. We need to build that in and make that a part of the overall budget analysis and the overall plans for that. And there was also um, information that was shared about having a central, I don't remember which panelist, whether it was Mr. Boone or whether it was person who talked about the feasibility of having one central point of entry. So if that panelist could uh, expand on that, who, there was one of the panelists who talked about- I believe about. it was Mr. Boone. Okay, Mr. Boone. If you, if you can be unmuted. Um, thank you for the question, uh, uh, Chair Barra. Um, in my counter at McEvers College in 2017, uh, our student government went to Dr. Crew and informed them that we had homeless students on campus. Dr. Crew didn't hesitate. He established what we call the Transition Academy now on campus and put me in position to build this academy up. Within three years, we have served over 500 students that's either homelessness, food insecure, or housing insecure. And what I have learned in encounter with these students is they do not like going to one office telling a business, going to another office telling their business, then going to another office. It becomes traumatizing when you gotta constantly keep telling your story over and over and over again. So what I have done over the last couple of years is I have developed relationships with DHS, HRA, community-based organizations in which the transition to Canada becomes that single point where students will come and I would help to navigate the, the, the shelter system with them. Because what I have also encountered is that when a student comes or they go to the, the homeless shelter on their own, they get treated like they less than a human being. And it's sad to say, uh, Chair Barron, these individuals that's treating our people, our students like this look just like you and I. And I just got to call it for what it is. And, but however, when we intervene, it's a different story where we helping them to pretty much navigate. So to, to get straight to the point of answering your question, students do not like going to multiple office seeking services because this is why they hide in the shadows because they don't want to be ridiculed. They don't want to be embarrassed. And just to highlight another point, when a student is homeless, what happens is they begin to distance themselves from student activities and, and the peers until, until you don't see them anymore. Thank you. And a final question for Ms. Persinger, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on providing services to students uh, in a different format than what would normally have been provided? In other words, being online and counseling online, what has been that kind of impact that counselors have found? So I think that question would probably be better um, answered by one of the counselors. I could tell you a bit more about, about access to, uh, to classes and things of that sort, but if really, if you're interested in access to counseling, mm -hmm. I think that, and Ms. Frank, I believe mentioned a little bit about that. So could I ask Ms. Frank to go ahead and answer that? Yes, what kind of challenges have you faced in transitioning from in-person counseling to the new format of online? A lot of challenges, but we're trying to overcome them. The counseling office is still open to students. Um, we um, Students can email our office if they have any particular issues that they want to speak with the counselor about. And um, there's someone who does all of the intake every morning. Uh, the email is um, looked at and all of the calls are assigned to different counselors. Uh, students can also call the counseling office and, um, and um, they're, they're, they're told that they can see a, talk to a counselor via phone. We have Zoom hours every day uh, 
two hours, Monday to Thursday, where students can actually come in and see us uh, if they wish. Sometimes they come into the Zoom room and they don't want to be seen, but we can still talk with them. Uh, as of last week, we have a new phone system, which is called Jabber, that students can actually call my extension at the college which is sent through my computer and I can speak with students. So we have, um, we have counselors who are trained in psychotherapy. They can see students if students are depressed or have some, some severe depression or severe anxiety. Uh, they can talk with someone on, on, on an ongoing basis and that student has the person's direct extension and they can talk to them on a daily basis uh, uh, if, if necessary. So the office is open. The students are so happy that they can actually hear a person's voice because um, through our CUNY, it, it's everything is basically through emailing and uh, students sometimes have a long lag time and someone can answer their questions. So they basically come to us, which keeps us very busy. Uh, so, so we have an open door to speak to students and they are utilizing the services. We are all very, very busy. Okay. Well, I want to thank this panel for participating in this hearing and giving us your testimony. And at this time, I'll ask the moderator if there are any other members of the council to offer questions. If not, we can call the next panel if there is one. There are no council member questions at this time. So we will move on to the next panel. We have um, two more panels left. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a, a few second delay when you're unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The next panel in order of speaking will be Melanie Cruvelis from the Young Invincibles, Sarah Perez Cotoreal, uh, Saif Alam, and Hugo Fernandez. I will now call on Ms. Cruvelis. Time starts now. Great. Good morning, folks. My name is Melanie Cruvelis, and I'm Senior Manager of Policy and Advocacy at Young Invincibles. I want to thank the members of the Committee on Higher Education for today's urgent hearing, um, and particularly thank you to Committee Chair uh, Inez Barron for her tireless commitment to supporting community students, um, including those who are experiencing homelessness. So as Chair Barron noted today, CUNY had a, homeless, uh, a homelessness crisis even before the pandemic began. Um, in 2018, Young Invincibles held focus groups across the city where we heard about the barriers that unhoused students face when trying to earn a degree from CUNY. Um, we heard about challenges from the lack of truly affordable housing um, to a housing system that is not designed with college students in mind. One Hunter College graduate told us about losing her dorm housing the day of her graduation um, and becoming homelessness the same day that she earned her CUNY degree. COVID-19, of course, has made the college student homelessness crisis even more dire. Uh, an April 2020 survey from the uh, Healthy CUNY found that nearly half of CUNY students are worried about losing their housing during the pandemic. Uh, the researchers also found that housing insecurity is strongly associated with anxiety and depression, with serious impacts on students' ability to persist and graduate from college. Uh, and these findings should al ring alarms for anyone who's concerned about the city's recovery from COVID-19. You know, CUNY can be a driver for equitable, recover, uh, equitable recovery. We have, you know, research and research that shows how important it is for upward mobility. Um, but if we don't get serious about meeting uh, CUNY students' most basic needs, we'll leave behind thousands of low-income, Black, Brown, and immigrant New Yorkers. Um, so to address this basic needs crisis facing CUNY students, uh, we'll, we'll need uh, proactive leadership at the campus and sit, city level and a serious push on the state to reverse decades of austerity budgeting for CUNY. 
In my written testimony, I provide detailed recommendations on supporting the increasing number of housing insecure students. These recommendations include making it easier for, uh, for students to receive emergency aid, including students who need to apply for aid multiple times. This is particularly urgent given the latest round of stimulus funding. Um, we're also encouraged to hear about the students thriving uh, think tank that the Vice Chancellor uh, Maybank mentioned, and we're happy to hear that students are a part of that, and we're here to support the development of that group. Um, we also believe that we can expand the single stop approach to the uh, campus food pantries and re envision these pantries as hubs for students to receive support with public assistance programs like SNAP and housing applications. Uh, we also call on the council to improve uh, coordination between CUNY, DHS, HPD, HRA, and other city agencies that can support these students. We heard today from the Transition Academy that they've been able to do this work at Medgar Evers, and we need to scale that across CUNY. Um, we also do provide some state level recommendations. So in addition to advocating for raising taxes on the wealthy to help fund our public colleges, uh, we also urge the passage of statewide legislation that creates uh, some of these uh, on campus liaison at every public college in New York. Um, and briefly, I'll just mention that the liaison role can be really, really critical in making sure that we're uh, counting the number of students experiencing homelessness every year. So I'm happy to provide more details uh, in the questions period, but thank you again for today's hearing. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Sarit perez Cotoreal. Time starts now. Good morning, my name is Sarit Cotoreal. And I'm a young advocate with Young Invisible. I was born and raised in Dominican Republic. I came to the United States in 2015. I have always wanted to attend to college in the US because I understand the importance for my future and the well being. I started school at Borough Manhattan Community College and I'm now a senior at Lima College, studying accounting with planning graduating in spring 2021. Housing security in Holland is very real among college students, even before the COVID 19. I should it is worse now given the economic crisis this pandemic has created. Create. Unfortunately, I found myself dealing with housing insecurity while I'm CUNY. In 2019, I had to reduce my hours from my full-time job to accommodate my full course law of 15 hours. That reduction in hours mean I couldn't afford my rent. I don't have my relatives here or enough saving to move to a more affordable apartment. I reached out to a single stop at BNCC, but they didn't have a program that will help me with my situation. I applied for a school emergency grant and, go, and got no response. I shared my situation with my professor and they connect me to the Office of Student Affairs where I was able to reduce food support. However, they couldn't nothing about a housing and had no choice but to move into a shelter in the Bronx. As you can imagine, this was an incredibly difficult decision. When the pandemic began, living in the shelter as a full-time student was a challenge. Residents were not allowed to use laptops in the shelter or access to Wi-Fi. When class went online, it became hard for me to keep up with schoolwork. I was stressed about constantly need to find a place to work outside of the shelter. About a year ago, I became pregnant. As a result of my condition, I was finally able to place my to place um, temporarily at Lima College. In March, we um, moved our day of August. I have to say that this was only done with support of friends who connect me to Timothy Hunter, the former CUNY student government president, who was able to work with university to make this happen. This was only because I was pregnant, homeless, and had a good academic standard that I obtained this housing. Unfortunately, in August, I had to move out of the dorm, and now I can only afford to rent a shared room with a stranger, but this is better than going back to the shelter. The New York City shelter system is inefficiently managed. While I was there, I was forbidden to move to other shelters without any advance notice. One of the times this happened at three in the morning. Even the pandemic, even before the pandemic, obtaining a house, affordable housing in New York City was incredibly challenging. We had numerous restrictions for full-time students. So presently, being a student parent with a new board doesn't automatically qualify me for housing. Many landlords doesn't accept city housing voucher or the voucher amount are too low to automatically afford a place to rent. As shelter resident, I qualify as a as shelter resident, I qualify for a city fair voucher to help me pay for an apartment. Many let alone didn't want to accept the voucher of the because of the amount was too low. Unfortunately, uh, by that time I moved into the dorm at Lima College, my city fair voucher expired and I was unable to renew it because I was no longer in the shelter. 
the only way I could get voucher again was to go back to the shelter, which it was my last resort. Based on experience, I recommend CUNY better support homeless students and prioritize them for free on campus housing. Homeless students should receive more help with their basic needs, such as taking away the Section 42, close the limited renting to a full time students. CUNY should also work with New York City Department of Homeless Services, New York Housing Authority, and Department of Housing Preservation and Development to help make housing more affordable for CUNY students and make sure a student living in a city shelter are support. I also think it would be helpful for a student to track homeless students to help them get the support that they need to complete their education in education. In addition, more accommodation for a student in shelter is needed to, so that they have access to technology and internet needs to continue education. Lately, it is important to increase access to food centers to all the students, including those who are homeless. Thank you so much for the opportunity my, to share my story in order to help more homeless students obtain housing resources and support that they need to graduate for college. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Saif Alam. Time starts now. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, members of city council, members of the university, uh, my colleagues from the university student senate, members of PSC, and members of CUNY administration. My name is Saeed Falam. I serve in the CUNY University Student Senate. I'm a graduate delegate from John Day College, and I'm testifying on behalf of CUNY students who are facing housing insecurity. Last year was the downfall of our economy due to COVID-19. According to recent data, 55% uh, of CUNY students face housing insecurity and 14% of CUNY students face homelessness. The number of uh, housing insecurity has increased dramatically for 2020 since uh, many students had to leave their dorms and others faced ev evictions. Last summer, I was part of the University Student Senate um, grant, Emergency Grants Committee and witnessed many students who were in need of grants to pay off their rent. Also, CUNY has raised money and the government contributes some federal funds, but it's not enough to support CUNY students who face housing insecurity. We have many international students and out-of-state students who live in dorms. Both international and out-of-state students pay more for their tuition and housing costs. Students have expressed frustration that they have to leave their dorm and have, uh, have difficulties finding a place to stay. Students study in CUNY to earn an affordable and high quality education, but removing and relocating international out of state students can cause them to not properly concentrate on their studies. Also, this could result them to not remain on track for graduation. Last year, I reviewed uh, 850 um, emergency grant applications, and many applicants requested grants to cover their costs. I have been reading Applications and students have expressed that they were not able to enroll in CUNY since their landlords have been pressuring them to pay rent. They expressed frustration that they lost job and could not pay rent. Some students who wanted uh, grants to live with their family, but their loved ones do not have enough funds to pay their rent. Students were able to receive $200 grant to cover their expenses, but they're still needing more funds. During the pandemic, the federal government provided the CARES Act and raised money to support CUNY students. The federal government provided $118 million of CARES Act funding to CUNY. Each CUNY student can receive, uh, receive up to uh, $2,000 of CARES Act, depending on their income. Students from all CUNY campuses were able to raise up to $70 million to support students who are facing housing and food insecurity. Students were able to receive, eight students were able to receive $500, up to $500 of emergency funding. However, the funds of CUNY students received from the CARES Act funding for spring 2020 and emergency funding for fall 2020 is not enough to cover all ex monthly expenses. Many of our CUNY students are still facing financial constraints to pay their housing expenses to their loss of employment. Students still need financial support for their housing expenses in 2021, since we are taking classes in distance learning more. 
In response to the problem that Cuban students are facing with housing insecurity, I urge the city council to lobby the mayor and our city to provide $34 million to CUNY so students can receive up to $1,000 of grants to support their housing expenses for the spring 21, uh, 2021 semester. Our govern governor also needs to do more to address the problem our CUNY students are facing. I also urge the city council to, to demand Governor Cuomo to lobby the Biden and Harris administration to provide additional $118 of the CARES Act funding to CUNY to support CUNY students to pay off their um, expenses, include, um, including remaining housing costs while taking classes in distance learning for 2021. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Hugo Fernandez. Time starts now. Hi, I've got a five minute speech and three minutes to read it. So I'm declaring an audible. Uh, sorry to my colleague, uh, Professor Kamara from John Jay, who wrote a really good uh, statement, which we will submit later. I wanna thank the council and Chairperson Barron for uh, letting me speak. I like your style. <laughs> So I'm going to say I've gotten an education from all of you. Uh, uh, I should state that I'm a professor, Hugo Fernandez, again, from LaGuardia Community College. I'm involved with governance at the college as well at the university-wide level as a member of the executive committee of the University Faculty Senate. In that role, I've been on committees of the Board of Trustees that include facilities and student affairs, a nice crossroads. Uh, while I was on the facilities committee, I urged Judy Bergstrom, the former uh, senior vice chancellor, to put money into emergency housing for students. And uh, that never happened. We never got a chance and now she's gone. Uh, I feel that uh, interestingly at a time when the city had dollars to build homeless shelters, but nobody wanted them in their neighborhoods, CUNY was sitting with uh, a lot of land and even buildings that were going unused that could have been retrofitted or uh, been used to build emergency housing for students. We know, everybody said it, when students go homeless, that's it. You can forget about the class, you can forget about their GPA, you can forget about graduation rates and retention. So it's a major issue. And for me, it's not enough to send them somewhere and hope they get a place to live. I, if a student comes to me, uh, I would like, and tells me they're homeless, I wanna find them a place to sleep tonight. And most faculty don't know, don't know what to do when, that, when they face that. Students don't know what to do either. Uh, and so what do people do when the, something is overwhelming? They pretend that they can't do anything about it. I don't believe that. I believe that this can be solved because by the way, the problem was bad before the pandemic. The pandemic has only made it worse. And when I would bring this up, folks in fundraising would, would ask me, well, how many kids do you think are homeless? I, I said 30,000. Now that you, with the data you're looking at, the numbers are probably much higher than that. So uh, I think this problem can be addressed, whether it means a city council pays for emergency uh, housing on campuses, whether it means DASNY, the dormitory of the state of New York, comes up with those dollars. But when we get a new vice chancellor facilities, you can bet money if I get his ear, or her ear or their ear, I'm gonna say this is priority one for me, has been for a while. We can solve this problem. It's whether we are prepared to address it and you know, do everything it takes to get and take care of our students. Because when we get a person at home, they stay in school, they pass class, they graduate. Time expired. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes this panel. Uh, we will move on to the next and just final. Wanna, I just want to say, I want to thank the oh. panelists. Thank you. I just want to thank the panelists for their presentation. And uh, it's always most impressive and most impactful that those who are daily interacting and those who are in fact, fact, the uh, persons who are most impacted by the situation come and share their testimony. So it, it's good to know that, uh, that people are persisting. It's good to know the challenges that they have overcome to get to the point where they are. And it's also important for us to know 
that we've got to respond, not just here and say, oh, you know, that's, I, I empathize with you, I understand you. We got to turn that into action. And I again call on you to advocate and push for the governor to make the budget adjustments that are needed. How you can run a state without a plan for revenue is unconscionable. You can't. You've got to have the resources and the funds coming in. Yet Governor Cuomo did not have a revenue package. How do you do that? How do you not identify sources of money to come in to meet what you know you're going to have to uh, provide? No revenue package, no way of identifying money, no, no, no desire to get the super rich to contribute an extra 1%, 2%. So we've got to have those financial resources and we've got to exert our pressure on those uh, budget persons to make it happen. And I often say people, yeah, the governor proposed it, but the legislature approved it and made it happen. And I, I'm one for calling to say that people need to contact their legislators and say, listen, we can't go through this again. We can't not have a budget revenue package. So I encourage you to find out who your assembly member is, who your state senator is and call them and tell them uh, they have got to generate the revenue to have it in the budget to be able to respond to our conditions. I wanna thank the panel for their presentations. Thank you for your testimony. And Sorry about I'll that, Chair Barron. Thank you, call the next panel, please. So the next and final panel will in, in order of speaking will be Ramon Leclerc and Sarah Ortiz. Ortiz. Uh, just a reminder that just a reminder that, that once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you begin your testimony. Once a sergeant at arms sets the clock and gives you the cue, all testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few seconds delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Uh, I will now call on Ramon Leclerc. Time starts now. Good afternoon, panel. Um, my name is Ramon LeClerc. I am testifying purely from a, a lived experience. Homelessness and being a student at CUNY has, has happened, has been a problem far before the pandemic. Um, I actually started my college experience after I aged out of foster care and um, began my college experience at Queensborough Community College and then transferred to, Q to BMCC where um, I was living in a shelter uh, in Jamaica, Queens called Bob's Place. I had a, an experience where I had stopped going to class because my textbooks were stolen stolen in the shelter and I was afraid to um, go go to my professors and tell them that my that I was homeless. I went to the counseling office to be reinstated after not attending classes for the rest of the previous semester. Uh, and the the counselor told me that you know, I'm not the only homeless student. So I was able to become more forthcoming with my professors the following semester and throughout the rest of my um, time in BFC and I transferred to Hunter. I feel like there's more, like not only we need to open up dorms, but there needs to be more accessible and affordable housing for college students. 
because living in a shelter, it, you can't get any coursework done. I was working part-time and also attending classes full-time. I hardly ever had time for myself uh, being either running to the library to study classes and work. It was a full-time job within itself, and I actually ended up having a meltdown. Uh, I see my time's expiring, so I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Last on this panel, we will hear from Sara Ortiz. You may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Sorry. Time starts now. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Um, my name is Sarah Ortiz, and I'm a second year student finishing my master's degree in international migration studies at the uh, Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, I also serve as vice chair of graduate affairs on the University Student Senate. I felt it my moral obligation to submit my testimony today in imploring the members of this committee to prioritize housing and security among CUNY students, which has affected me and those I love um, and I care about on a profoundly personal level. My building is a privately owned and managed pre-war residential building in Washington Heights, Manhattan, District 10, which I was happy to see council member Rodriguez, my council member on this call. I hope he's still, still, still on. Um, on June 10th of 2019, I reached out by email to our current landlord, Wadsworth Ventura Associates, LLC, who owns 40 plus buildings across 23 zip codes in New York City for the first time to inform them of a pest issue that had come to my attention. They have yet to address the problem now over a year and a half and countless correspondences later, which is why we have taken the drastic measure to go on rent, rent strike until the issue is resolved. Um, I never mind that I lost my job due to COVID-19. Um, when the pandemic started at the restaurant, I was working as a server. Um, along with 113 other <laughs> um, After a constant flood of 311 complaints, I reached out to a variety of city agencies, um, including the Mayor's Office to Protect Tenants, Department of Mental Health and Mental Hygiene, among others. And basically our landlord's response was to nail um, ply boards onto the front of our building, essentially trapping these pigeons inside. Um, there have been patterns of asthma in my building. Uh, there has been a death in my building um, under suspicious circumstances uh, across the, the way from my uh, unit. Uh, a woman was denied uh, basic heating and essentially died of, of asphy asphyxiation in her unit. Um, so basically, we owe $30,000 in back rent and legal fees, and this corporate slumlord is suing us for non-payment of rent and ultimately the threat of eviction, um, despite being in violation of the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act um, warranty of hab habitability. Um, so I implore your committee to acknowledge that environmental racism is real and has had a pernicious effect on working class communities of color, of color across New York City. It's no accident that these communities are disproportionately impacted by pre-existing illnesses such as asthma, making us um, more susceptible to contracting COVID, but also the tra tragic statistics have laid bare the reality that working class communities of color across uh, the city are at higher risk of death as well um, due to COVID. The corporate real estate industrial complex of New York City has had its hand in the po pocket of politics for far too long with le lethal consequences for our families. I will not stop until we can together till the soil of justice and finish what has been started, an autopsy of the intersectionality of public health and housing insecurity across New York I'm City. Fired. Uh, just, um, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, I assure you that um, once we look at this in-depth study of housing insecurity among CUNY students, I won't have been the only, the only one affected by this issue. So as CUNY students, our lives depend on um, action uh, at the state level. There are three bills before the state legislature that together would meaningfully address the um, COVID-19 housing crisis and keep our families healthy and housed. One, the cancel rent bill, two, the evic uh, eviction moratorium, and three, the housing access voucher program that protects small landlords, um, but does hold accountable the larger um, corporate real estate industrial complex. Thank you to the members of the committee for hearing my testimony today. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge uh, your testimony and thank you for coming and sharing with us. And yes, we do have many unscrupulous landlords, some of which get highlighted on that list that gets publicized, but there are many more than that. 
And we do have to recognize that we have a responsibility to protect tenants and to make sure that we respond to those kinds of issues uh, that affect their livelihood and their health. I do also want to say that it's an interesting concept of having, of making sure that we provide housing for students. We do have other set aside categories. We talk about veterans getting housing consideration. We talk about seniors. We talk about those in need of support services. So certainly it's not uncommon that there are uh, populations that are set aside to receive that. And that certainly could be something we look at. I also say that the issue of homelessness is, as you have said, far reaching, particularly in New York City, and particularly with the city trying to remove itself from the responsibility of being a landlord. So now the city is looking to privatize the NYCHA developments and pass that on to another entity so that the city does not have to have that responsibility. So all of this is a part of the whole capitalist push to uh, increase the profits irrespective of the needs of the people. But we're gonna remain mindful and cognizant of that. I hope that you have a, a successful conclusion to, to your efforts to maintain uh, decent housing where you are. And thank you both for your efforts. And uh, to Ramon, congratulations on your persistence in moving forward through the educational process. And with that, I will turn to the moderator for closing uh, instructions. Thank you, Chair Barron. Uh, now that we have heard from everyone that has signed up to testify, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom right now, and I will call on you in the order of hands raised. In the meantime, I'd like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, Chair Barron, I don't see any hands raised in the Zoom. Thank you so much. And with that, I wanna thank all of the panelists who gave testimony. And I especially wanna thank all the behind the scenes staff who helped to have this uh, committee hearing go so smoothly. And I now declare that this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>